So welcome everyone to live from Northwoods and Waters on February 28th, 2023 in the snowy Northwoods and Waters of the St. Croix Heritage Area. So happy that you can be here with us today. Uh, our mission is that Northwoods and Waters of the St. Croix Heritage Area unites the people of the St. Croix River watershed on behalf of our shared natural, cultural, and historic resources. And I am a proud member of, the, of this nonprofit, a little small band of people um, that are involved in the, the core part of it that, that have thousands of friends throughout the watershed. So welcome to all of you. The St. Croix watershed is our stomping grounds. We cover two states, four sovereign nations, almost 8,000 square miles. We cover or touch 18 counties, a bunch of other information you can use in some trivial pursuit sometime. Um, and we have about 12,000 years of human history. Once the glaciers receded, humans came, stood up on some of those hills and said, man, this is a great place to raise a family. And that was history. So we have several different goals. Our goals are to create sustainable economic opportunities. Many of our small towns are struggling and we hope that we can provide economic opportunities based on our heritage that will enhance those communities and the quality of life within them. It's our goal to connect the region in order to help preserve and enhance the resources that we have within this nationally distinctive watershed and to increase the awareness and understanding of our heritage and the resources that demonstrate that both among the people who live here, because I learn something new each and every day as a part of this board. And we don't know, we, there's just so much to learn here. And so we don't know everything that is here and we want our kids and our grandkids to understand what an incredible place this is. We also promote and interpret the region to visitors and a global audience. We have many international visitors that come to this place already, and we know that more would come uh, if they knew about us. The United States has now 61 national heritage areas. Those of, the, of you that have been on this before have heard me say, you've had 55. Well, now we have 61. There was a new act that was just passed that strengthen national heritage areas and brought in six more. Each of them tells a significant part of our nation's history. They are all incredibly unique. I'm guessing that some of you online have been to national heritage areas um, before. As you can see though, in Minnesota and Wisconsin, there are none. So we think we should put the national in our name because we believe that we have um, incredible stories to tell that we have an important part of our nation's history and the um, authorities who are in charge of such things agree with us. So we've met all 10 criteria and it takes an act of Congress though. And so we're working on that. In the meantime, while we're waiting to become designated as a national heritage area, we get to do these wonderful programs across the watershed, one of which is live from Northwoods and Waters. And so I am, I am so thrilled to welcome you to today's live um, where we have Heidi Barr, one of my favorite poets and authors who is going to read from Collisions of Earth and Sky and Ryan Rogers. Um, good to have you with us, Ryan, who's gonna talk, he's gonna share some photos and stories about Winter's children. And to uh, moderate this whole thing with us, um, I'm pleased to introduce you to Thomas Wayne King, who has, this is his brainchild. And uh, um, without further ado, I turn it over to Tom. Did we lose Tom? No, I'm here just trying to unmute. Let me have a sticky trackpad here. All right. You are. Thanks. Hi, Tom. Thanks, Marty. All right, everyone. We're going to begin just real quickly. We're we're right at the headwaters of the Wisconsin side of the St. Croix watershed. We are in Solon Springs, Wisconsin. And just a few steps out our door is Upper St. Croix Lake. And if you canoe down to the end and hike up the, the portage trail, you will connect with the, the very beginning 
sprinkles of <laughs> the trickles of the St. Croix River system on the Wisconsin side. And what's cool, if you walk just a little bit further, you will connect with the headwaters of the Brule, which now in this geologic age flows north into Lake Superior. But at one time prior to glaciers, it flowed out of uh, Lake Superior or the prior lake there all the way into the Mississippi. So we are right on the water highway of the copper culture people from Northern Ontario, Michigan, Minnesota, and copper from this area has been traced all the way down to Central America. Uh, we're right on that water highway and it's a very cool place to be. My uh, indigenous and European family came here and met up about 1850 to 1870. So we've had uh, a home life here for some time, although Debbie and I have lived in 14 different cities, including suburban New York and Chicago. Glad to be home. Uh, there's a line from Steve Paulus, who's a Minnesota composer from his song, The Road Home. And it says, there is no such beauty as where you belong. Mm -hmm. So we belong in the St. Croix watershed. Let's celebrate it tonight. We're going to begin with Ryan Rogers. Ryan Rogers is a freelance writer and avid skier whose works about nature and the outdoors have been widely published. He is the former board president of the Standing Cedars Community Land Conservancy, a 1,500-acre nonprofit land trust along the St. Croix River, and now lives with his family in Duluth. Ryan will read to us from his book, Winter's Children, a Celebration of Nordic Skiing, and tell unpublished anecdotes about skiing in the Northland. Ryan Rogers, welcome very much. So glad you're here. Debbie's going to start the timer and I will disappear off your screen. It's all yours. We won't interrupt you. We'll give you a five minute alert. So, sounds great. Thanks, Tom. I'm going to attempt to share my screen here. Let's see. All right. I think that's working. Tell me if it's not. Um, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll read for five minutes and then I'll, I'll show a few slides. This is a prologue from the book. I wanted to outski the champion. I figured I could. Born of 160 years ago, Torjus Hemisbeet had won the world's first ski marathon in Norway using a single pole before immigrating to Minnesota. I'd signed up for the American Burka Biner with old Torius in my sights. His time was mediocre by today's standards, but was a good goal for me. I hadn't skied much in recent years and was no longer young. I was running on the country roads between fields of corn and soy in the town where I lived in Wisconsin, just across the border from Minnesota. Torius's brother Michael had given skiing exhibitions here in the 1880s, shushing down the slopes of the St. Croix River Valley and what would have been a taste of home to settlers of Norwegian descent in a titillating display of a strange and wild sport to others. Those Hemisphere boys were the best in the world for a time, coached by the great Sandre Norheim, a Norwegian peasant who became a skiing star for a decade in middle age before immigrating to America and giving up his bones to the North Dakota prairie. When I'd started running a couple of months before, I'd had to stop every mile but now I was able to finish a five mile loop without walking. Jogging against dusk, I passed the end of a long driveway and stopped. A pair of skis leaned against a split rail fence with a handwritten message on a sheet of notebook paper taped to the fence stating that the skis were giveaways. They were Norwegian Normarks, wooden skis from the 1970s, the same kind that had introduced the generation of Americans to cross country skiing in the long awaited boom for the sport. I'd been obsessing over old wooden skis for months and this felt like fate. So I ran home as quickly as I could, grabbed my car, drove back and snatched those beauties up. They had barely been used. Their bottoms bore a little wax residue and a couple of tiny nicks, but the original three pin binding showed no wear. I didn't have three pin boots, but I had a pair of clunky touring boots and bindings collecting dust in my garage. When I took the boots off the shelf and turned one of them over, a chipmunk stash of shelled sunflower seeds poured out. I unscrewed the old three pins and to my relief didn't have to drill into the old skis because the replacement binding screwed right into the same holes. Again, I thought the stars were aligning. I sought waxing instructions from a wooden ski enthusiast I would befriended and followed his instructions from a, instructions for preparing the skis. 
I scoured the bases with mineral spirits and ordered pine tar. Some of these old skiers I'd been talking with spoke fondly of pine tar. It was always the smell. The daughter of a champion Duluth skier who had been dead for nearly 60 years tenderly recalled her father applying the sticky stuff in their family's kitchen and the odors wafting off the skis. An aging man who had for 20 years maintained a ski trail system as a pledge of loyalty to his dead best friend wrote a poem describing the passion that motivated him to clear windfall in the summer and groom trails in the winter. For the love of the smell of pine tar on the base of a wood ski, it started. He'd written the poem on a napkin for an award he received, read it aloud at a ceremony and thrown the poem away. He said he didn't remember the rest. The season was looking good. Snow fell for two days. The twin cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul had several inches on the ground by December 1st. Duluth and northern Wisconsin were buried in two feet. Youpers in the upper peninsula of Michigan had been skiing since before Thanksgiving. I popped open the tin of pine tar. It was black and thick like molasses. The Normarks were made of hickory, amber colored with flecks of dark grain. I layered a film of tar onto their bases with a paintbrush and then used a butane backpacking stove to torch the tar. You're supposed to hold the torch to the skis until the tar bubbles but not so long as to char the skis. The blue flame licked the skis until tiny bubbles rippled across the tar. The hot pine tar did smell good, of conifers and solvents. The scent would linger in my garage for weeks. I wiped the base of the skis until the towel came away clean. The bases were darker now, and the wood was sealed for a time for moisture. I put on the touring boots, grabbed the woodies, and left the garage for the early winter's eve stepping into the bindings and skiing into the woods next to my house. After the snow, the sky was hyper clear with Orion back home for winter and Sirius huge and bright like a sticky gob on a lens. The skis were light and soft, lively on my feet. I'd learned about another champion skier who'd come from Norway to Minnesota, Peter Fosside, who had inspired two generations of Minnesotans to ski cross country when next to nobody was doing it. This old Norwegian skied into his 90s. Holding ski poles, he used to lift up his hands and say, in the Norwegian accent he never lost, life is good with two of these. On a cold, clear night, in a promising start to winter, I agreed. I'll leave it off there and I'll, uh, I'll show a few pictures here. Oh, first I'll, I'll comment on these characters on the cover. That's. Ole Mangseth and his three sons in Minneapolis in 1923. The oldest boy there with the skis had just won the national uh, boys jumping title. So they were all looking pretty happy that day. Ole had come from Norway, like most of the competitive skiers of the early 1900s. And he, he settled in Spooner, Wisconsin, him and his brother, John. And they, they looked for a, a suitable ski hill, but they did not find one. And I, I should add that that jumping was the was the dominant form of skiing up until World War II. Cross country had a niche following, but it was never big. And downhill didn't take off until after World War II. The following year, though, John and Ole they they moved to to Frederick, Wisconsin, a little ways south, and they they were happy to find a some good looking ski hills. And so they they built themselves a jump on a on a neighboring farmer's property. And one Sunday, they tried out their jump. The property owner and some other neighbors stopped to watch this. The, you know, these guys had never seen skis before. And here were these two, these two guys with, with strong accents, who probably didn't speak English very well. And John went off the jump. He, he nailed it. He landed well. Ole followed, and he had, a, he had an awful crash, you know, yard sale at the bottom of the hill. And other farmers looked at each other and they they did not like what they were seeing. The farmer who owned the property, he thought he was going to have to shut these shenanigans down. But Ole rallied. He he jumped again. He landed well and he he won them over. So for some time after that, locals would gather on Sundays to watch the the crazy Norwegians of Seven Pines, as, as they were called, show off their their jumping prowess on a hill north of Frederick, Wisconsin. Um, eventually, Ole was poached by the, the Red Wing Ski Club, and then later, after that, he was poached away from Red Wing by the, the Itasca Ski and Outing Club up on the Iron Range in Coleraine. 
the Manx still live up there today. They're the descendants of Oli. And Frederick, though, he, he and his brother, they built a, a log cabin for a, a wealthy grain merchant named Lewis, Charles Lewis. And it was, it was a fancy rustic lodge on a 1500 acre estate. And, and, and the, they built this cabin and it, it, I guess it's still there. It's a, a president stayed there back in the 1920s and it's on the National Historic of National Register of Historic Places, but I, I've heard the cabin's in bad shape. The lodge at Seven Pines, I think it, it's called, somewhere by somewhere north of Frederick. I was, I was always curious about that. Never had a chance to follow up on it much. That's only Manx. And um, the first organized ski league in North America popped up in Minnesota and Western Wisconsin in the in the late 1880s to basically because Minnesotans were pissed off that this Eastern newspaper had likened St. Paul to Siberia and said it was unfit for human habitation. So local civic boosters in St. Paul, they organized this festival that would showcase the, the fun of a, of a Northern winter. And the events at the first winter carnival were based on team sports. And um, so some ski, some ski leagues were, ski clubs are founded to, to show off at this, this 1886 winter carnival, including one in Stillwater. And the conditions were bad. So the, the races were, the jumping contests and the cross country race was canceled in this first inaugural winter carnival. Um, you can see some bare ground there in the photo. And, but they, I mean, they really had an amazing ice castle there. That thing is massive. For some reason, the ski club members here are sharing skis. Maybe they didn't have enough to go around, but at the, the next year, they did have a jumping competition. And that competition was, was dominated by a, by a Norwegian immigrant named Michael Hemisfeet, who, who for a time um, lived in St. Croix Falls. This photo here is of the, the first Stillwater Ski Club. Um, I'm a little curious about it. it. It says Michael Hemisfeet is the guy sitting on the right side. I don't think that's him. I, I think he's the guy standing. And I did not find that he had skied for Stillwater, but there it is in the photo. The same year, 1888, he was, he was in St. Croix Falls, and I'll get into that in a minute. Um, the Norwegian Ski Club of Stillwater went on for a time. It had a jump right by Lily Lake, um, across the street from where the hospital is now. I've never walked around there looking for any sign, I, but you know there is a, a steep hill there. I think it, I think it, um, the slope under the under the jump ran out onto the lake. Michael Hemisvet, though he was he was a star skier in Norway in the developing world of competitive skiing. But he was also a poor uh, peasant farmer. And like many other poor peasant Norwegian farmers, he, he immigrated to, to Minnesota. And he, first he was in Western Minnesota, but he was um, recruited to St. Croix Falls to start this, this ski club, St. Croix Falls Ski Club. And he also was offered a job at, at the head of a, um, what was maybe the, the first ski manufacturing company in North America. It was called Excelsior Ski Company. And for a couple of years in the late 1880s, they, they did make skis. I was not able to find any of these skis. And I, I, I don't imagine it was a very big company, but, but it was there for a couple of years. And Michael led the, the team on ski practices in St. Croix Falls on the Esker, right in town that the Ice Age Trail goes over. And a pastor in Taylor's Falls across the river observed this strange Scandinavian sport, he called it. And he, he sketched out these drawings in his journal. And he, he, was, he was quite taken by it. He was a little horrified of it, but he was also very intrigued by it. It was kind of neat drawings there. They, I, I imagine those skis are a little bit exaggerated in scale, but interestingly enough, they used a single wooden pole there. Michael, though, he was eventually poached away from, from St. Croix Falls and he settled in um, Red Wing, which had a, a really amazing ski club. And they were the they were kind of they were the powerhouse in the 1890s, early 1890s, in this early thriving ski scene with clubs from 
um, Ishpeming, Michigan, around Minnesota, and also uh, Western Wisconsin. And Sandy in the back, our Tor, our Michael and his brother Torius, and they, you know, they were they were the world's greatest skiers at the at the time. And they both they both settled in in Minnesota for a time. But the financial panic of 1893 put the put the young ski league out of business, and um, they went their separate ways after a while. But it, for for a while, you know, it had it had some glory glory days. I mean, that was a national news magazine. This Frank Leslie's Illustrated, and there's uh, Torius on the cover. You know, so I, I can't imagine that that hill they're pictured is in Minnesota, but you know that's what it says. The Panic of 1893 also gave rise to the, the American ski building industry, which was something I didn't really know existed. Getting into this, and there was a, a another Norwegian immigrant to Minneapolis, Martin Strand. He um, he grew up in Minneapolis in this Norwegian neighborhood, and. Um, he got he got work with his uncle surveying in in the the pine woods of northern Wisconsin, and that this is not Martin Strand, but this is the same era. You know, he, he surveyed for a rail line going north up to Superior through th through the virgin forests. He was doing well for a while. He went out of business, though in Superior he wound up moving back to Minneapolis, and he observed these boys skiing in parks on these shoddy skis made out of barrel staves and so he got the idea to start a ski company which he did it burned down twice in minneapolis but eventually he found a home in new richmond wisconsin that and they built him this fire resistant concrete factory and for years he was churning out millions of skis the biggest ski producer on earth probably at the time norway was still a, a you know still a, a more of a skiing hotspot than the Midwest, but they had lots of small scale producers as opposed to large scale producers. This was a typical ski of the era, a Holter ski from Ashland, Wisconsin, but Martin Strand bought out Holter. They were steamed single piece wooden skis, pretty, pretty primitive like they'd been for, for centuries. There's one of his bindings. It would have had a leather thong that wrapped over the toe, over the top of that. Okay, Ryan, we're at the five minute uh, alert here. So uh, keep on going and just uh, bring it in as you want. And, and if you want questions from others, uh, you just ask and people I'm sure will, will supply you with questions. So five okay. minutes to wrap up. Okay, I'll keep it moving here. A Martin Strand ad with a jumpers freak model ski. I don't exactly know what that was, but it sounds pretty intriguing. There's this factory in New Richmond. You know, they churned out a lot of boards. The first um, person to sell skis at the state fair, Martin Strand, he also sold canoe paddles, toboggans. And when the National Ski Associ Association that had sprung up bought a pair of skis for um, President Coolidge, they, they used Strand skis and presented them to the president and first lady on the White House lawn there. Strand was eventually overtaken by this guy, Christian Lund, and Northland skis. He's got quite the outfit on there. I wish I knew more about. And Northland was based in St. Paul and they were a dominant ski maker in the country for, for decades. They sponsored Olympians. And for years, jumping was a, was a thriving sport. It, it was, you know, it was a mainstream American sport, which was news to me and was fun to learn about. This is at Bush Lake in Minneapolis or south of Minneapolis, Bloomington. There was cross country skiing, but it was it was a niche sport. And but you know, and the and the number of people who did it were far fewer than than jumpers. This is at a national championship in the 1930s in Minnesota. Last photo I'll show is um this is in the 1940s. I really like this shot. It's it's right in Interstate Park on the frozen St. Croix River, looking looking down river at the the. Wisconsin side on the left, and I think I think it's called the Summit Trail, if I remember right. That goes up there in Minnesota, on the on the right. We have Wisconsin on the left, Minnesota on the right. And I'll 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 leave it there. If anyone has any quick questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Okay, go ahead, folks. Ryan, I'm curious about bindings, the evolution of bindings. Could you take us through uh, that in a quick way? 
Well, um, I mean, for, for a long time, they were, they were pretty simple. It'd be a, I mean, it, it used to be like a, a woven birch root around, around the, the, the heel with a, like a leather toe thong. And the, by principle, it, it remained, it remained the same for years. I'll go back to this strand binding. I mean, this would have a toe strap and then people would back that up with a heel strap. And it, it really wasn't until, you know, within the last 50 years that they began to really change. I guess, I guess the, the, what was it? The, the rat trap binding, the bear trap binding came out in the 1930s. And that was a, that was more suitable to downhill skiing, but it wasn't great for cross country because it was such a, such a heavy duty binding. That one could be, you could lock your heel in place with that one if, if you so, if so desired, but it was kind of bulky for, for cross country skiing. I can vividly remember when my toe strap, just slider skis, we had a piece of a rubber inner tube and ran it around the back of my heel. So I would keep my boots in the toe strap. You know, I, I talked to a couple of people who did the same thing. They would, they would keep their, the bicycle tires that they popped over the summer and they'd use those for, for, um, for their, their, their ski bindings in the winter. Yeah, absolutely. Other folks, questions or comments for Ryan? We got a couple yeah. minutes left. We had uh, a lot of skis that looked just like the ones you were showing there. And uh, we also had some of the, the rubber tubing, but mostly leather, mm. leather straps to, to hold the binding on. Yeah, I mean, I imagine it wouldn't make things any easier, especially if you're soaring off a jump, you know, with a, you know, basically be a thin leather belt lashed between the toe strap and your, your heel. I mean, they're quite a bit beefier now, the jumping ones anyway. And of course, cross country ones are just these tiny techy little toe attachments. Ryan, do you know anything about the use of uh, mohair in, in, uh, on the underside of uh, wood skis prior to wax? I don't, I'm not aware of that being a thing. I mean, I, I guess, you know, like the Altai ski, I mean, they, they use pelts on the bottom. And you, you can still buy those. I, th I believe the brand now is Altai. Yeah, but other than that, I... I I've used uh, well long ago seal skins, and that's time there, Ryan. Do uh, you have a just a concluding comment quickly, Ryan? Oh, um, great to be here. Thanks, thanks for having me. All right, like thank you. Thanks so much, Ryan Rogers, everyone. And the name of your book, one more time, is uh, "Winter's Children: The Celebration of Nordic Ski." Fantastic. And where can we find it online? Um. I I think, you know, Amazon or U of M Press website, it, it's around, should be pretty easy to find, I, I hope. Awesome, thank you very much, thank you. Thanks for having me. All right, next up, we have Heidi Barr. Um, Heidi Barr will be reading selections from her newly released book, Collisions of Earth and Sky. Heidi's a writer and wellness coach with over 15 years of experience in health promotion. She's a published author in many genres, including creative nonfiction, poetry, even a cookbook. Um, she's an advocate for the St. Croix River watershed and was selected as one of the five poets of place during ArtReach, St. Croix's NEA-sponsored program, Big Read. So Heidi Barr, it's all yours. Uh, and again, I'll come on at the 15 minute point and, and give you just an alert there. So take it away, Heidi. All right, thank you so much for the introduction. It's good to be here with you all tonight. And I am gonna start, I'm gonna bounce around a little bit from a few of my books. And I'm gonna start in Collisions of Earth and Sky with a short section about Nordic skiing, just to transition us from one presentation to the other. This is a very short section at the beginning of a chapter called Digging for the truth when I'm talking about growing up in South Dakota. Moody County, South Dakota, 1991. Standing at the highest point as far as the eye can see, I gaze down the slope, skis aimed downward. Pushing off, I gradually build up speed 
And for a few seconds, I feel like an Olympic racer conquering the super G course. Crouching lower, I tuck my poles under my arms for the grand descent. Halfway down, I hit a clump of grass and fall in a tangled heap of arms, legs, poles, and old school three pin binding Nordic skis. Because the mountain I was just careening down isn't in the Alps or even the foothills of the Rockies or the St. Croix. It's in the cow pasture across the road from my childhood home on the prairie of South Dakota. And instead of scrubby pines and alpine bluebells, the base of this slope come spring is covered in big blue stem and pass flowers. At 12 years old, this is my mountain. So I grew up on the prairie in South Dakota with my, we would take our, you know, my parents had these old, old, old cross country skis and boots were all really big. They didn't fit anybody and we'd, you know, we would just bomb straight down these cow pasture hills and there were barbed wire fences at the bottom and, you know, we'd just go for it. <laughs> and there, we, there was a lot of crashing, um, but that was my introduction to Nordic skiing and I have continued on ever since. And I'm going to go next into, this is a book, so I'm, I'm deviating from my script a little bit, but this is from a book that came out a lot, six or six years ago now, I think. And it's about getting outside, which is also what my recently released book is about, but this will be a good introduction to that book. And it's also about skiing. So, Ski Fairy. I woke up this morning feeling off. Not terrible, but not good either. Definitely not good enough to feel positive about the traje trajectory of the day. After a weekend of great conversation, cozy fires, time away from a computer, a day when office work was back on the agenda seemed like a practical joke of the meanest sort. How could it be time to spend another day sitting in front of the computer, making phone calls, working on things that seem so irrelevant to the grand scheme of what matters in the world. And how could it still be 15 degrees below zero at 8 a.m. for the fourth week in a row? I was unsettled and it seemed like interacting with anything even slightly undesirable would cause me to slip into an all day melancholy. As I was resigning myself to a day spent tapping at a keyboard, I saw the sun through the window and noticed the sparkle of the snow against the skeleton trees. But the frigid temperature and the schedule of my afternoon overshadowed the beauty I usually see in those things. I felt myself slipping into a haze of wanting something different. I felt like someone who doesn't like winter and someone who dreads the work week. So I went outside. Instead of letting myself simmer in that haze of wanting, I put on my ski boots and prepared myself for a slow face freezing loop around the perimeter of the lake through knee deep snow. I wasn't looking forward to it, but I know enough about health and wellness to understand that getting some fresh air and exercise can boost one's mood. And enough about motivation to know that you don't have to feel motivated to do something. You just have to do it. So I went outside down the snow crested steps to the snow crested dock and started skiing through the snow crested snow drifts. And then I noticed something. As I glanced to my right, I noticed something that looks strangely similar to a track that you might see at a state park after the trail groomer has rumbled by. Some kind soul had taken it upon themselves to groom a Nordic ski loop on our little private lake. It was like a fairy had come by and sprinkled magic dust over the lake, turning it into a paradise instead of a frozen wasteland. Granted, it wasn't perfect. There were washed out sections and it wasn't always as straight as you might see in a dedicated trail system, but there they were. A set of groomed cross-country ski tracks right outside my back door. For someone who checks the grooming conditions at the state parks a bit obsessively this time of year, this was reason for celebration. It was also enough to snap me out of my melancholy, melancholy stupor and remind me of all the things that are worth celebrating during the days I spend here on this earth. Despite work computers, endless phone calls, and frigid temperatures, 
There will surely be days in the future when I feel off balance or in want of something different. But there will also surely be little things like an unexpected ski track that punctuate even the dreariest of days with yet another detail that makes life worth celebrating. So skiing and getting outside, those are two very important things to me in winter, especially a winter like this one that's, I love winter, but this winter, something about it is just, I don't know. <laughs> The, the raining, the ice, the thick ice, and then a little bit of snow, and then the rain again. So, but being able to go outside, looking all the way up, taking in the natural wonder that helps me stay grounded and reminds me of, okay, we're going to make it through this and spring will come again. Um, so Collisions of Earth and Sky is the, the new book, is all about connecting with nature for nourishment, reflection, and transformation. And my hope is that readers can use it as a little bit of a tool for personal reflection, self-inquiry, and just a chance to really you know, dig into what helps them stay grounded and what they need to do to essentially contribute to the healing of the world, which is a huge thing. But when we boil it down, all we can, any of us can ever do is be in our bodies, rooted in the ground where we live, and reach the community that we interact with on a daily basis. Um, so that being said, I'm just going to read a small section of collisions from the introduction, give you an idea of what the book is all about. The land where my childhood home sits in South Dakota gave my transplanted German and Norwegian personal roots a place to grow and be nourished. A place to interact with the wildness that is still the undercurrent of the world. I hope the land I am steward of now in Minnesota will give my daughter's roots the same nourishment. The land holds stories I will never know, as well as many that I can learn if I'm willing to listen and dig deeper than is comfortable. When I live grounded in my creatureliness and let nature inform my choices, I live the version of my life that feels the most real. The pages that follow are a bit of a winding trail full of opportunities for self-inquiry and reflection. It's a trail that meanders through myriad topics and landscapes, and it's one that is full of questions. I hope you, my fellow traveler on this journey of living, will move a few more steps toward more fully embracing your own creatureliness, your own place in this great web we all share. And let that be a foundation, even when there are more questions than answers. Perhaps you'll even discover a few things you didn't know were missing by hiking with me through these pages. I hope through truth-telling and having compassion for yourself and your fellow beings that you'll find your own way to live the questions with nature as your guide. Because when we let nature inform that self-inquiry and reflect on what comes up when we do, little by little, we uncover the parts of ourselves that can best contribute to the healing of the world. So that gives you an idea of where the book goes. It goes all over the place, you know, winding trails. I go into all sorts of different topics. Um, but I think the section that I'm going to read next encompasses a lot of what the book's about in, in the one piece. And I, I've sprinkled invitations to various things throughout the book. And this is the very first invitation. The Invitation to Dance with Mountains. I often wonder what it would be like to dance with mountains, to sway with the majestic alpine wildflowers that dot the valleys, or to listen to the whisper of clear snow melt as it cascades to lower ground over a bed of stones smoothed to perfection, to kiss pine needles or to breathe the mysterious scent of ancient bedrock. 
I wonder what it would be like to mourn or prepare the dead or sit Shiva in community with earthy loam or lichen. To walk in step with the peaks that have been stripped of life, the woodlands that have been clear cut, the toxic rivers, the fracked tundra, the topsoil that can't hold on. I often find myself wondering how cruelty, choices that hurt others and hate can coexist with grace, goodness and love. Is it possible to hold space for, for them all and hear what they have to say? These are my questions. Perhaps some of these are your questions too. You surely have plenty of your own. Dance with mountains. Sometimes I hear the wind whispering an invitation to dance with mountains as it blows outside my windows or when I'm walking to the mailbox. I'm so often in the garden or the woods, at work, at home, at the grocery store, but at the same time absent, physically present, but mentally checked out, worried, lamenting, even laughing, wondering what's next. I'm searching for validation in this human experience, but not sure what that even means. Can you relate? Validation is one of those chameleon words, a word that takes on different meanings all the time. I don't want to need validation, but it's one of those things that we humans crave. Acknowledgement matters. It's easy to listen to others validate their experiences and encourage them to feel what they feel and be present to each moment, but harder to be on the other side. It can be scary to make the changes that are essential for living in a way that feels attuned to what your soul truly wants or what the world truly needs. I've been working on being in my present story in a way that is rooted in the more beautiful world by paying attention to what my neighbors are going through and helping when I can by not putting my own emotional needs last all of the time by taking steps to walk more lightly on the earth. Some days it feels like it will be a constant struggle. I get tired easily, but can sense the turning of my face to the beauty that is still possible. There it is again, dance with mountains. We are not moving from here to there. We are making here and there by moving. We are here to disrupt the stories we feel stuck within. We are learning a different definition of urgency. We are walking with a foot in two different worlds. To recover is to take on a new shape. We have to go to the edges of our skin. The self is that which we haven't met yet, but somehow it's always been inside us. We have an origin, but we don't always know it. Is it wild? What if where we come from doesn't fit who we are now? How do we find the courage to stand still enough to find the path? How do we find the courage to move toward right action? Dance with mountains. Who am I? Who are you? Can this question even be answered? What is a person really? A physical body, a set of cells and tissue, skin, a certain hue, hair, a certain texture, body, a certain size and shape, a way of thinking, of feeling, of loving, of existing alongside others. Sadness to joy, to pain, to exuberance, a bunch of stuff all wrapped up in a living creature. We're assigned a gender at birth, but it might not fit. Maybe it's changed. We're a relative or a partner or a child or a friend. We're lovers of nature, gardens, villages, cities, technology, books, mountains, deserts, prairies, rivers, soil. Some of us don't know what to do with ourselves in a big group and like to be alone. Some of us like constant companionship. All of us benefit from loving relationships and close community. You and I, we are a paradox. We're on the earth, but sometimes we float above where we think we are as worry or lament or projection claims energy. We are souls, the wild part of the self that can't really be defined, but that can be sensed as something greater than we give ourselves credit for. Okay, Heidi, that's five minutes, actually it's four, but you have four minutes to wrap it up. This is wonderful, just keep going. And if people okay. have questions, just hop in there, folks. 
Perfect. Something that is the earth, that is the universe, that is the cosmos experiencing life in a human body. We are everything and nothing, all that is beautiful and haunting and destructive and healing. I'll stop there. Wonderful. All right, so that is the first invitation in the book. And then we move into the section on origin and then we move into journey, and then we end up with returning, integrating all of the lessons that you've hopefully uncovered as you have hiked with me through the pages. So I'll just stop there and see if anybody has any questions. How did that book come about? <laughs> that is a big question. <laughs> um, I think this book came about just as I've continued to write about, like, as, so this is my seventh book. And over the course of my, my writing, every book I've ever written has been about nature, basically. Not explicitly about nature connection, but that's, that's what they're all about <laughs> if, you, if you compare all of them. So I took an opportunity to be very intentional and write a book specifically about that integrating kind of where I am now and digging into the past. Thank you. Others? Other questions or comments for Heidi? I just want to say thank you, Heidi. I could just listen to you all night. I am, I always find myself just transfixed and transported um, as you read and kind of jealous of your girls because I'm sure you've read to them their whole lives. Um, it's just lovely to hear you read. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, that's really good reading. for you. Lost yeah, track I gotta, of time there. Yeah, I got to say that uh, the notion of dancing with mountains, um, there's an old Zen concept that the mountains walk. We just don't notice that they are walking. And uh, But thinking about... Uh, dancing no that's cool stuff so yeah thanks very much yeah, you're welcome i love all the questions mm. questions are good yep it's a book full of questions there's even a whole appendix full of more questions at the end <laughs> that's where my work as a health coach starts coming out and helping people dig into mm. what they need to dig into get their own answers mm. Heidi, who's your publisher? Collisions was published by Broadleaf Books. They're out of Minneapolis. Can you say something about Twin Flower? Do I have the right name of the, of the company? Yep, so Twin Flower Books is a fairly new um, bookstore in Center City, and they've been very supportive of local authors. So if you ever find yourself needing a place to buy a book, windflowerbooks.com is a great little shop to support. Yeah, it's great to support our independent bookstores. Mm -hmm. um, Tom, if I could just take a moment. Go ahead. I want to introduce Melanie Kleiss to you. Melanie Kleiss is our new um, co-chair of North Woods and Waters of the St. Croix Heritage Area. Melanie, you want to just greet the group for a second here? Hello, everyone. Um, and thanks for coming. And and thank you um, to all the presenters, too. It's a really great program. Thanks, Melanie. We have, Heidi, you have a minute left. Anyone else have uh, questions or comments for Heidi? Or Heidi, anything further you want to put in? I'm curious, Heidi, if you collaborate with others with writing workshops. Every once in a while, um, yeah, I, I used to do. Well, I so let's see. Before pandemic times, we I was doing some poetry workshop kind of retreat stuff. So I'm looking at doing something like that again in the summer. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Okay, we are at time there, Heidi. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. We're going to transition now, folks. We have three excellent authors who have joined us tonight for just a brief read. We'll get a little bit of their, their work and then hopefully we can arrange to, to have them back. We're going to start with Clayton Bai. Uh, Clayton lives in Dryden, Ontario. 
and has been writing and publishing in a wide range of genres for over 30 years. He's currently president of Northwestern Ontario Writers Workshop, NOWW, and is here this evening to talk to you about that organization. And so I, that was my one minute intro there and we'll start the timer. Clayton, you've got seven minutes, so go for it. Well, I had no idea what I was walking into, so I've completely changed my agenda. We'll see how it goes. Now is a charitable organization that's been supporting the writers and literature of our area for 25 years. With about 120 members, we provide an annual program of workshops, most of them free, readings, writers meetings, and much more. Our major annual event is the now International Writing Contest, which winds up with an awards banquet, readings, keynotes, and workshops by really successful Canadian authors. The contest actually closes tonight at midnight. There are six categories in the contest, but one in particular I think fits. It's the Bill McDonald Prize for Prose, and it must feature Northwestern Ontario in the story or the poems. You can find out more at nowwriters.ca, and I'll put the website in the chat when I'm done here. Now, a little bit more about me. I'm half Norwegian. Most of my family settled in Minnesota, some in Wisconsin. My grandfather, Leif, and his brother, Odin, were the only ones who moved to Canada. That wasn't far enough north for me, though. I decided to move to the Arctic for several years before coming down below the tree line again. The story I'm going to share is fictional, but it was inspired by real experiences I had in the north at that time. And I hope I will get it done, but here you go. It's called The Disappearing Frying Pan, and it's a Mike Money short. I have a series of these. The young pilot who picked him up at dawn hit the tops of the trees with his skis during takeoff, grinning from ear, from, from ear to ear all the while. Not that Mike Money really minded. After a night in Webequay, he was happy to see anyone. The place bothered him deeply. He was pretty sure it was haunted. And now that he was back at Big Trout Lake, things seemed to be as normal as they ever got. He saw a pack of at least 15 wild dogs. You could safely bet that the band would be trying a dog shoot sometime soon. He caught them at it last time, so he knew that they'd be keeping a low profile for this shoot. It was a touchy situation. The feral dogs had to be put down before they mauled or killed a child. But doing so, especially within town limits, was against the law. A clutch of old ladies giggled when they saw him arrive at the Hudson's Bay store, though to be fair, the old women giggled at most everyone. They stood beside the store, all of them dressed in bright and flowery dresses, under which they wore several layers of clothing. The Kokums dressed like this in the summer and winter, even at the monthly square dances. He'd never seen them break a sweat. Several young bucks came out of the store as he went in, pretending he didn't exist. It didn't matter that some of them were his age. He was the law, the guy who checked luggage whenever a plane came in, ensuring no liquor was making its way onto the reserve. The cop who went after sniffers, wife beaters, and troublemakers. And even though the band paid his wages, he was what, he was the white man's watchdog. But there was one thing out of the norm, and Mike had been trying not to think about it. He drank the Coke he'd bought at the store and drove over to Tom Fisher's place, attempting to enjoy the gorgeous blue sky. Then he couldn't ignore it any longer. He was here to relieve the nurse who had sat up all night with the body. Jillian Sanders was a pleasant change. Here was someone who was happy to see him. She was new to the res like him, and they chatted enjoyably for a few minutes before getting to the business at hand. Jillian, could you tell me what you know about last night's incident? Sure thing, she said. I got a call from one of the elders. It was James Beardy. He told me that Tom Fisher had killed his brother Jack. They'd been playing cards when Tom suddenly stood up, grabbed the frying pan off the potbelly stove they've got, and whacked Jack so hard his head has a big dint in it. You know how... Oops, I just missed my page here. Do you know how James came by these details? The nurse nodded her head. Tom's wife was there. 
She said that Tom put the cast iron pan back in its place, then he turned and walked out into the snow. No coat or anything, just as runners. Did you observe anything else yourself? Jillian gave Mike a bit of a dark look for that question. Well, yeah, I've been here all night. I'd still like to hear your observations. Well, Jack was cold when I arrived, so he'd been dead a while. I mean, you can feel how hot to keep it in here, right? Mike nodded. Oh, isn't that nice? My computer froze. Can you folks still hear me? Oh. There, I got it going. <laughs> Mike nodded, and his head is most certainly stove in. His skull has been crushed. I swear I can see the maker's mark indented along one side of the wound. No frying pan, though. Mike actually sighed. That was just the way his days had been going. Care to speculate as to where it might be, he asked. Surprisingly, the nurse nodded. With a little bit of a grin, she said, Tom's wife walked out of here with it. Have to ask her, because she hasn't been back since I showed up. Mike got the wife's name, asked a few more basic questions, took the body into custody, and let Jillian head back to the nursing station. Apparently, she had a shift to cover. Okay, Clayton, we're at about the minute and a half point here. If you can land the plane in a bit, that'd be great. Okay, well, I won't get through the story. Basically, he ends up chasing the frying pan all around the community. One person gives it to another and to another. He uh, ends up joining uh, a group of people in the night standing around a burning house that there was nothing they could do about stopping and just watching it until the flames started to go down and then he found his man uh let's see what else the frying pan f finally ends up with a woman who decides that she's she needs one and she's going to use it for cooking and mike just gives up there's so much for his ev evidence and then he takes the fellow in the morning to the plane to go down south to Sulik out. And it ends with, Tom said nothing when he was given an old coat that had been hanging around the station, nor did he speak when Mike took him out to the airstrip. But when the twin engine, Piper Aztec, pulled alongside, the old man looked at Mike with a sharp eye. Funny name, you, he said, and got on the plane. The sun was finally coming up, clouds shone pink in the east, and Mike Money shook his head. What a hell of a posting this was going to be. All right, where can we find this and your other works? <laughs> well, you can you can find me. Um, I can give you my email. And the book that this is in is still available through me. I'm a ghostwriter by profession these days, so I don't do a lot of fiction. Okay. I don't – I imagine you could find it in store somewhere. It's called um, – Behind the Red Door was a collection of short stories. Behind the Red Door, collection of short stories. Clayton yeah. Bye, thank you very much coming in from Ontario. Appreciate it. You're welcome. My, my Canadian relatives came from Eastern Quebec to Wisconsin. So yeah, we, we share a lot there. We are going to move on next to Carol Dunbar. So Carol, get ready. Debbie will get the timer set here. Um, Carol Dunbar, who is one of our newest best friends and lives not very far from us, Carol is a working writer and former New York actor, playwright, and coloratura soprano who left her life in the city to live off the grid. Her essays and stories have appeared in the New York Times, the South Carolina Review, and Wisconsin Public Radio, among others. She writes from a solar-powered office on the second floor of a water tower in northern Wisconsin, where she lives in a house in the woods with her husband, two kids, and a giant Alaskan Malamute. The Net Beneath Us is her first novel, and it's a good one. We both read it page to page, and I'm going to read it again. Carol Donahue, Carol Donahue, Carol Dunbar, sorry. <laughs> we have too many writers with similar names. Carol Dunbar, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom, for the introduction. Thank you, Marty, for organizing this. I've really enjoyed this. It's really nice to meet some new writers um, and to learn about a potentially national hopefully organization. Um, I was married outside along the St. Croix River and my husband and I planted a tree during our wedding ceremony. And this was years before I wrote my tree novel, um, The Net Beneath Us. I like to think of it as a story about how to make your way back from a dark place 
by staying open to the wonders of the natural world. Uh, the story is about a young family building their house in the woods of northern Wisconsin when a logging accident changes everything. The wife mother figure Elsa Arneson determines to carry on while caring for their two small kids in the unfinished house her husband is building for them. So this is a house with no running water, no split firewood for heat, and she has to generate her own electricity. But she is determined to stay in the house because she is haunted by her regrets. So I want to read to you a, a section from Elsa Arneson's point of view. Um, the book starts with the logging accident. It happens right away on page two. And then uh, in the next chapter, we meet the logger's wife, Elsa. And it's very important to me that you all know her name was Elsa years before the Disney movie Frozen came out. But I kept the name because uh, it was oddly perfect. Uh, Elsa is in many ways a kind of a princess. She is not from the Midwest. She isn't from anywhere. She didn't grow up the way her husband did in the country. She wouldn't consider herself a country woman even now uh, after living in the woods for years. But for the first time in her life, she is starting to feel that she belongs. So the section I wanna read to you is from page six and it, it, it happens moments before she learns about the logging accident, minutes before uh, the Jeep comes driving up the driveway to take her to the site of the accident, she has this kind of mystical encounter. Uh, and that's the part I'll read to you now. It came out from the dark behind the pines, behind the garden a puff ball that floated in the breeze. It came like the white fluff of a dandelion, only larger, an airy jewel suspended in sunlight that seemed to glow, although it was a hundred feet away. It moved on an invisible current and drifted through the trees, played peekaboo behind the boughs, bobbed in and out of shadow. It captured her full attention then because of how it crossed their field toward them and then hovered right in front of her, right at eye level, how friendly it seemed, interested even. She wasn't imagining it. Finn in the backpack gurgled and kicked his legs. She opened to the moment, forgot about the laundry basket in her hands, the baby on her back in the house they were building. She forgot about everything and watched this puffball as a buzzing sensation moved through her, small at first, and then rising to fill her entire being, her whole body filled with a sense of rightness, a sense of peace so strong, she couldn't imagine feeling anything but good ever again this beautiful day, this house they were building and the children they were raising, all of it exactly right, exactly as it should be. After getting so many things wrong, after losing her mom and leaving school and disappointing her dad, she was finally in the right place, doing the right thing and they would be okay. She thought this and the puffball whirled away spinning off into the trees. So the last thing I wanna share with you is about the title of the book, The Net Beneath Us. It refers to the metaphorical net of community and family, the people who have our back, who catch us when we fall. It also refers to the metaphor, uh, the literal net uh, in the root systems of the forest where I live and where this novel is set. 
So if you're familiar with the groundbreaking work of biologist Peter Wollaben, or if you've seen the PBS documentary based on his work, The Hidden Life of Trees, then you know that the way trees communicate to each other is through this underground network. And this is how they give nourishment to each other and support and how they send signals. And this is the knowledge that I'm building on in this book. So there's a lot of tree wisdom in this uh, novel, not, um, and it is in many ways an environmental story, not about how we should save it, but how it can save us. Yeah, one minute. one minute to bring it in. I That's my talk. So if anyone has any questions, I have a minute left to answer. Yes. Others, what would you like to ask Carol? Carol. And it's caroldunbar.com, right? caroldunbar.com. Yep. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah, I suppose I, I could I could share with you that um, if you want to see any photos of what it's like to live off grid, um, my husband and I built a solar array. So our home and my office are 100% powered by the sun. So if you want to see photos of that or of the diesel generators we used to run and that I talk about in this novel, um, I'm very proud of the book club kit on my website. So you can click on that and look at pictures. Awesome. Thank you so much, Carol. Thank you. Anchoring our program today will be Barry Whiteman. And just a, a few thoughts. It is just wonderful to hear about the natural world. And we, we're all kind of North American centered, but remember that the, the planet goes further than Wisconsin. Yeah, it really does. We aren't the, the, the limits to the planet. And so Barry's going to share with us some uh, writing that takes place in a different country, but that also, of course, has trees and natural world and humans. And the, the unique tie-in that Barry has is as president of Wisconsin Writers Association, he has done so much to bring literacy and enthusiasm and success to writers all over Wisconsin. So we are just deeply appreciative to have Barry be our guest tonight. Barry Whiteman out of Milwaukee area. It's all yours. Take it away, Barry. Hey, thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, this little snippet is a tiny little clip from a novel in progress that I've got going on. And yeah, it takes place in uh, the forests uh, surrounding Narita, Japan, 50 years ago. Um, little, it was just a quiet little town, but things were going on. There's an airport that was being built in the uh, in those forests and rice paddies, and there was some trouble. There was radical students and police battling all the time. And this little snippet has two characters, uh, two computer engineers, one American, one Japanese, and the Japanese guy, he is one of those radical students. So uh, again, it's 1972, and it's uh, in this dark forest. Yamashita and Fletcher follow the workmen down what is now a tunnel of bamboo. The forest is sudden. The early light of the morning disappears. Time stops, then reverses. 20 minutes, half an hour. The sun has gone back down and darkness returns. The lane becomes a path, soft, bit muddy in the middle, then a track. Ferns below and bamboo fronds above, wet with dew, brush their sleeves, heads, and backs. The path is soaking through their shoes. They catch up with the workman, their apparent guide, through the darkness. Now in single file, Yamashita whispers, this is the way, you must see this. The workman has a flashlight, necessary, but he uses it sparingly, on then off, no need to call attention to themselves, even in this place. The workman regularly turns, glances to their rear, any followers, unwanted guests, none. After what seems like a mile or more to Fletcher, but probably isn't, they come to a small clearing. The land begins to rise. In the black woods up a slope, a light flashes once, then three times. Silence. The sky, lightning again, is now visible through gaps in the forest overstory. Bamboo have given way to spires of cedar. They reach the top of the rise, following another series of flashing beams below. 
They climb down a small ravine with a creek gurgling over mossy rocks. Birds flutter overhead. Songs now ring through the trees. The air is thick with sound. Wind picks up overhead. The trees bend and whisper. The forest floor remains dark. Fletcher, Yamashita, and the workmen climb up the other side of the ravine, pulling themselves up, grabbing damp branches, testing footholds on wet rocks, slippery, slow. The workman reaches down the slope to Fletcher, pulls him up and over a rocky ledge. They stop. Fletcher, between the two Japanese, gathers his breath. Breath. He's losing interest. What the hell? Where the hell is he? What the, what the hell's going on out here? What's the point of this forced march? His shoes will never be the same again. Whose idea was this? Right about now, he'd still be in his warm bed back in Tokyo thinking about that chick the other night. Or maybe beer. Looking up the hill off the trail, at this point maybe a 10 or 15 degree incline, the black trunks of cedars arrow straight up like spiky hairs on the head of the ridge. Great arching branches reach above them. The air smells of fresh, damp wood, black earth, silence again. Silhouetted against a faraway patch of brightening sky, something large, like a seed pod, a pine cone waves in a sudden breeze, hanging below a thick bending branch. Fletcher, his eyes bleary from the long night, tries to focus, his heart thrumming from the hike. He picks up speed. Uh, may I have those binoculars, Yamashita-san? He scans the hillside above them, focuses, tries to steady the binocs, hold his breath. Mostly shadows, vague shapes. There one, then two, then three of those shapes, maybe more. They hang in a particularly stout stand of cedar. These are no seed pods. These are the size of humans. Dead men in full salaryman attire, blue suits, ragged, torn, sober ties knotted beneath the great, greater knot of thick ropes, hang motionless. Fletcher nearly drops the binoculars. Hanged men are everywhere, a scattered deck of tarot cards from a cedar gallows. Fletcher-san, Yamasa's voice is quiet, gentle, consoling. Please do not concern yourself. This is sad, but maybe, maybe you say a holy place. We must move on. Do not overly concern yourself. A cold stone absorbs, absorbs his gut. Silence. Not even early birds are calling. We'll stop there. All right. Fantastic. Okay. Comments, questions for, for Barry. Yeah, it's a crazy story. Um, it's uh, part of a lar very large, unwieldy uh, novel that. Uh, takes place in Silicon Valley, Tokyo, Hong Kong, and ancient Ming China, and uh, uh, all sorts of unusual occurrences. And uh, so, yeah, it's unusual. Well, you've had a lot of experience in, in Asia, at least in the Far East, right? Yeah, it's true. I would, uh, back in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, I was going over there a lot, like, uh, at the peak, maybe seven, eight, nine times a year, and uh, it was uh, it was very cool. It was very fun. It was quite a time. And what is the name of this book, and when will it be out? Oh yeah, well the the name of the working title anyway is Five Claw Dragon. And okay, what the heck is that? It sounds like a fu a kung fu movie, right? <laughs> but it, it isn't um, on uh, uh, ancient uh, on Chinese porcelain in Ming, the big vases. If you have a uh, a Ming vase with uh, a dragon on it, yeah, most of them have dragons, or a lot of them do anyway. But if you have a very high quality um, uh, vase with a dragon with five, and the claws had uh, the claw is five talons, that was very likely or possibly made for the emperor's household, mm -hmm. and uh, um, so I came across one of those things. Uh, at an auction house. I didn't buy it, but it's uh, uh, it was found in a uh, uh, a restaurant in Lisbon as an umbrella stand and was worth millions because it was a Ming vase with a five claw dragon. I'll be eager to hear more. Join it. Oh, there goes Debbie's uh, 
signal there. Well, Barry, thank you so much. And uh, I'll just say a few final words and then turn it back to Marty and, and Marty, Marty will uh, bring us to a close here. Um, I was just thinking that when Debbie and I first got to know each other, I heard dad who her book is about, those of you who know Gravedigger's Daughter Growing Up Rural, John was very active with a farmer's union in Wisconsin and, and as a farmer, a dairy farmer, and would go to Washington, D.C. often for meetings. And anyway, when I first got to know him, he asked where my people were from. And I said, well, Stolen Springs and around here. And he said, you know, I was sitting in an airport in, in Dulles Airport in uh, Washington, D.C. at that time. And some other man was just waiting. He said, where are you from? And John said, Wisconsin. And, and the guy said, uh, where do you live? Menominee, he said. And, and the, the guy in Washington, D.C. said, Menominee, I've never heard of that. Is that anywhere near Solon Springs? <laughs> so that was my intro to Debbie's family. <laughs> uh, and Solon Springs has become, of course, the, the place we love and the place we're going to stay and are just totally appreciative of all the talent tonight. Thank you. I just, I got to get back writing immediately. I can't wait. I, I quit being a binge writer. I'm a snack writer. So I snack right whenever I can. And you got the circuits rolling here, folks. Thank you. Debbie says thank you too. Marty, thank you. And back to you. Thank you all so very much. Um, I hope I'm kind of lost here what I've, I, I'm going to not share. It's what I'm going to not do. Um, this has been such an inspiring evening. It, it just kind of amazes me how the themes wove through tonight. We didn't plan that. We didn't choose people who would have the same kinds of themes or ethics. And it's just lovely how that all transpired. So I, I just thank all of you, certainly Heidi and, and Ryan, who are our, our main people here, but Clayton and Carol and Barry, you guys were fantastic. And and Tom, it's always such a pleasure. You you are uh, you just hold us all together on in in these events. We do this every fourth fourth Tuesday at seven o'clock, and so we invite you to the next one. Please uh, go to our website, sign up for our newsletter, and like us on Facebook, and that'll be the way you can stay in contact with with um, with us and we with you. And just from the bottom of our heart, we, we thank you so much for sharing your love for writing and your heart with us. We know that that's what you bring to these events, and we're just very grateful. So that's it for tonight for this Live from Northwoods and Waters on February 28th. I will... Uh, I'll just let the recording go. And if anyone wants to stay on, I'll just leave it on. If you need to leave, we will say goodbye with gratitude. Thank you.